welcome to Beyond. I'm Dr. Patricia Hill. And I'm Alan Steinfeld. Each week, we're going to journey into new areas of discovery and into lost knowledge. We'll be interviewing cutting edge researchers, leading scientists, and forward thinkers about unexplained phenomena on this planet and beyond. In this first interview, I'll be talking to John Burke. He's a geophysical investigator, and he'll be telling me about the relationships between Earth energies and ancient sites around the world. Our second guest is Nancy Talbot, who makes a connection between these energies and crop circles. So join us as we talk to John Burke and go beyond. On this program today, we'll be talking to John Burke, who's a geophysical investigator. He's going to be talking to us about the science behind sacred sites, crop circles, the ancient monuments, and what it is that makes them special, magical, and particularly sensitive to human consciousness. Thank you, John, for being here. Thanks for having me. You've taken instruments. You've measured what it is that makes something a sacred site. I actually don't use the word sacred for that reason. I believe that in most of these cases, it was a very physical purpose and a very physical action that occurred there, more so than a spiritual one. But uh, They are meaning places like Stonehenge, Stonehenge sure. Salberry Hill, and... Pyramids, both Egyptian and Mayan, um, North American Indian mounds. So you bring instruments to these locations, and what is it that you find? Uh, what I find is that in particular places and also at particular times of day, mm -hmm. it becomes clear that over and over again, the ancient builders of these structures primarily chose uh, types of geology, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. places where the geology naturally concentrated the normal electromagnetic fluctuations that take place on the Earth every day, mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. But they're more concentrated and stronger in some places. And over and over again, those are the spots where the ancient builders chose to place these structures. One that's lesser known, which is mm -hmm. these rock chambers or dolmens, as they're technically called, they mm -hmm. exist from England to Italy, but also throughout n the northeastern U.S. as well, uh -huh. and were built over a 3,000 year period. So they're clearly not a cultural phenomenon. They've been built by many different cultures in many different places. The roof, though, is usually flat stone slabs, often very magnetic rock. Mm -hmm. And what I've confirmed is it does stratify the air in here electrically. Uh -huh. the, there'll be negative air towards the top, positive air towards the bottom, and pulses taking place. You're saying the land underneath that whole area is conducting high electrical magnetic charge. Well, let me show you exactly. This particular one, which is in Mount Ninnam Park in uh, New York State, is located on a mountain that has high magnetic readings. And it's in an intersection of two zones on this mountain. Everything to my left and downhill here has got a much lower but very stable magnetic reading. As soon as you get uphill to my right from this spot, the readings start to rise dramatically and you start to get a lot of change. This is actually one of the more modest chambers. Uh, it's not too high. You've got a crouch in here. And, but this is a particularly energetic chamber. In fact, uh, a photo taken by one of my colleagues on infrared film, uh, sh there was nothing visible to the naked eye, but when the infrared film was developed, it showed a floating ball of energy right about here where my right hand is just suspended in midair with tentacles almost uh, emerging from it. It, lo it looks highly electrical. Wherever you have a site where mm -hmm. ground that is poorly conductive meets yeah. ground that's strongly conductive, at that intersection you have these magnification of all these effects that I'm talking about. And those kind of intersections are where these ancient monuments have been sited for 5,000 years. Well, this is some of the work around crop circles in England where these two different um, types of soil or earth come together. Well, all I can tell you is that mm -hmm. when I w worked there with um, Avebury, uh, Silbury Hill, and Windmill Hill, uh -huh. three of the oldest and largest megalithic structures in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, they are very close to one another. Uh, they clearly match up with the geology of this type. Uh -huh. And when I was there working on it, you could see these crop circles all over the place. Mm -hmm. 
what I'm fascinated with is something in the human physiology that can detect these electromagnetic currents. Sure. And is it Sometimes. about our physiology? The, uh, the, the simple law in, or principle in physics is called induction, mm -hmm. and it's actually the way our um, electrical power plants work. Anytime you have a changing magnetic field, uh -huh. that will generate an electric current in anything present that's capable of conducting electricity. Right. Now that includes the ground, and we have ground currents that run through the Earth every day. That's a standard part of geophysics. Mm -hmm. But our brains are obviously very good conductors of electricity, and so naturally we're going to also have electrical currents generated in our own brain. I had an interesting experience out in um, Petroglyph National Park, northwest of Albuquerque. It's the biggest one of these continuity discontinuities in the United States. Yes. So the geology is the most dramatic there for these energies. And it's Petroglyph Park because it's the biggest concentration of rock art. Uh, and during the course of a day, I stumbled into a surge of energy that was clearly being emitted from the rocks. There was clearly an electrical ground current in the rock there that ionized the air around it. And it began to just rise very dramatically at one point late in the afternoon. Uh, to, and I followed it as it spread throughout this ridge. It was very intriguing. And when I mentioned it to the, the uh, park ranger in the mm -hmm. visitor center, she said, you know, a lot of people come here and they go say, tell me, I always like to go up into the rocks and feel the energies. And yeah. she said, I've been dismissing them as a bunch of new age crazies, uh -huh. but you're telling me there may be something to that. So I told her about 2% of today's population. Uh -huh. The University of Munich and others have done very good studies demonstrating that a small percentage of even contemporary humans can just sense uh, very small disturbances in the electrical or magnetic fields. Probably if we were living in nature, we have more of that sensitivity. I think so, because normally we're surrounded by permanent magnets in the form of steel beams and the cars that we get into. Right. We're certainly surrounded by all sorts of electrical forces, and that's got to make us less sensitive than, say, uh. an ancient shaman thousands of years ago who spent most of his time outside. Basically, you're saying the land underneath that whole area is conducting high electrical magnetic charge. Well, now here what we're talking about is uh, three different levels of chalk aquifer that do slant up and hit the surface of the ground here. Chalk aquifer means there's uh, the soil is made of chalk, and underneath that there's water? or Exactly. Okay. Or within the uh, pores of the chalk, there's water. Oh, okay. And okay. what's important about that is that when water percolates through mm -hmm. porous rock, that alone creates electrical charge. Ah. So that's another effect mm -hmm. that I haven't mentioned until now, ah. which is really dominant in places like England that have a lot more limestone and chalk than they do, say, magnetic rock. Oh, I see. So that could be an explanation why there's more of these mounds and, and also crop circles appearing there. Well, there is a lot more, yes, of this, of this earth energy of an electrical nature, really, not so much magnetic. And you found that if an ancient culture placed a seed inside yeah. one of these um, mounds or sacred circles, they would increase their food production. How would that work? Uh, it, well, it, there are um, electrical forces that can be good for the growth of seeds. Yeah. And what one question I asked myself was, why did these ancient peoples go to such almost absurd extremes mm -hmm. to invest so much effort and energy into building these structures? When because I you're talking about a small population that's agricultural, right. and yet they put thousands of manpower hours right. into building these hills. Now you take Silbury Hill, right. uh, the largest mound in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, 14 million man hours, yet the population of the area is estimated to have been less than 4,000 people at the yeah. time. And it, on, in fact, the it, area had already been abandoned because of poor soil, uh -huh. and exhausted soil, poor farming material in the days before uh, the existence of fertilizer or crop rotation were known. Right. A s this small band of people moves back into this exhausted soil. Yeah. Uh, they're obviously scraping to get by as subsistence farmers, yeah. and they spend 14 million man hours building this mound. I wanted to know why. That seems like a sure recipe for suicide. How could they have known that that was going to work? I have to guess that it came from uh, r some form of original trial and error based uh -huh. on observation over hundreds of years. Because uh -huh. even Silbury Hill, which was put up 500 years before the Egyptian pyramids, that was already uh, 500 years younger than Windmill Hill Causeway Enclosure, which is next door to it. Now that was circular ditches. Uh, archaeologists have found wheat seeds that were brought there and placed in shallow pits in the mm -hmm. ground right where the energy would have been concentrated.
And they weren't seeds that simply fell in from a field. They were seeds that were carefully cleaned first. Any trace of uh, weed seed was, was removed. Somebody took a lot of trouble to take this somewhat va valuable seed and process seed, bring it there, and deposit it right in a spot that would have concentrated the same kind of energies that improved the growth. The, the substance of the force, the electromagnetic force that comes through there, what does it actually do to a seed to make it more productive? What we know the modern laboratory controlled versions do is to actually generate a physiological response inside the cell uh. that makes the seed uh, more uh, tolerant to the stress of free radicals. Because free radicals age the body, and exactly. if we have free radical protection, we can maintain a sort of vitality. Right, and the exact same thing is true on a more accelerated time frame in a plant that only lasts one year. So anything that does help fight off those will enable a more vigorous plant to grow and to produce uh, more food. We take it for granted, at least here today, that we'll easily have enough food to survive. These were subsistence agricultural uh, civilizations before mm -hmm. the effects of crop rotation and fertilizer were discovered around 1000 mm -hmm. BC. Mm -hmm. Once those were discovered, Stonehenge was abandoned. People stopped coming. Yeah. And that was true in these other sites, which uh, other uh, continents and areas that discovered uh, crop rotation and discovered fertilizer at different periods. Once they did find that, they didn't have to go to these great efforts. So Stonehenge was abandoned because... It uh, well, it was abandoned at the same time that, agri that agriculture in England began using fertilizer and crop rotation, and that's an awful lot of coincidence in my book. So your explanation would be that it was no longer needed to exactly. increase productivity, and also the Druidic societies around there were also dying out due to influx of other Actually, the, that's a misunderstanding. Oh, really? The Druids weren't even in England at the they time Stonehenge was abandoned. Then who were the people that built the... No, well, they're called the Beaker people based on the, the, the fact that they liked to drink beer and were buried with their vessels, and that's about all anybody knows about them. But I'm sure healing also was um, amplified in these kind of sites, these kind of megalithic sites. I, we don't know about that. Wh what is kind of interesting is, my, is the folklore from the last few hundred years surrounding mm -hmm. places like uh, Stonehenge and Avebury does stress healing and pregnancy as reasons to visit the site. And also there's an atmospheric components I haven't talked oh, yeah, about. They're true. less important probably, but they are known pulses that penetrate from the ionosphere that, mm -hmm. that sort of shake the Earth's magnetic field lines, sometimes very dramatically so for a small area. Mm -hmm. And they take place in the wee hours of the morning. Uh -huh. And uh, th there's a phenomenon known to psychologists as the 3 a.m. wow, uh -huh. uh, which is that time when you wake up in the middle of the night. You don't know why. You can't quite go back to sleep. Yeah. But suddenly a solution pops into your mind to some problem that you've been struggling with. Yeah, that happens. To <laughs> yes. Uh, well, and then you grab for a piece of paper and you write it down and... But what are they saying it's about from? Well, no one is saying anything on okay. in that regard as far as I know. But I, th I find it interesting that that's the same time frame uh, in during the course of a day in which all these energy fluctuations that I'm talking about are maximized. Uh -huh. And so perhaps there's a connection. That's right. a guess on my part. Well, have you yourself, can, can you talk about any experiences you've had at these areas? No, I'm a real slug. I, uh, <laughs> I've been to all these areas, and people ask me, what kind of special experiences did you have? And I've had none. I'm usually, though, bent over a meter in, uh, with a flashlight in a very, very different mindset. Uh-huh. So, so you don't I th feel anything. You're no, just um, I really don't. Yet I've had mysterious things like batteries fail in mm -hmm. my uh, camera, which when I took them away from the ancient site, mm -hmm. functioned perfectly again, bring them back, they fail again. Oh. I've had others working with me who've had that same experience. Although one, the first time I did go out in and out of one of these rock chambers, one of these dolmens, repeatedly crossing magnetic field lines, uh, during the course of a day, I actually feared for my life by the end of that day. I felt like I was going to have a heart attack. Because uh, some electromagnetic current within your body wasn't adjusting to all these different fields? Well, I just have to guess that maybe what was happening was the you know, electric currents being generated in my body at random intervals wasn't the best thing for my heart, perhaps. I so you know. did feel something? Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> You're not such a slug. <laughs> well, I had no, uh, no uplifting experiences. But, but I've been, frankly, quite uplifted uh -huh. by realizing that... Uh, we're effectively in a dance, in an electromagnetic dance with our home planet every day, whether uh -huh. we realize it or not. And realizing it is a, is a thrill for me, and I think it would be a thrill for a lot of people to realize that this is something that's happening with all of us all the time. 
I'm talking to John Burke, geophysical investigator. We've been talking about the mounds around Europe and the Americas, and you were saying, John, that there's a whole bunch of megalithic sites in this country that have been built for various reasons. Th that's part of a whole uh, system of mound building that built thousands of mounds throughout the middle part of our country, all up through the Mississippi River and its tributaries. So these mounds are like hills that are hollow inside, right? No, they're not hollow. They're mm -hmm. solid man-made mounds, though, um. that were erected by simply people carrying basket loads of earth up and dumping them, and we're talking the tune of 20, 30 million man-hours in some of these cases. But they're huge, these mounds. Yes, yeah, some of them. W the biggest one in Cahokia, Illinois, rivals the Great Pyramid in Giza in terms of volume. Now, one of the most intriguing mm -hmm. ones is the Serpent Mound. That's well. very well known. And its geology is particularly dramatic in all these regards. Mm -hmm. We took uh, instruments and seeds there twice and find there are in interesting forces at work there. Produced minor improvements in the seed uh, one of the times we took them. But a second time we took them, there was a thunderstorm in the area. Uh -huh. And that produced dramatically altered magnetic fields and electric ground currents in the area where the seeds were placed on the ground. These shamans or sensitives in these ancient cultures followed the Earth's energy and created the serpent mounds around the uh, movement of these energies? Actually, that serpent mound, the whole site it's placed on is a very narrow bluff, and that whole bluff is, is very uh, powerful in regards to uh, magnetic alterations, and it's in the perfect location to maximize electrical currents, although I, those weren't measured. And I did measure electric charge in the air there that was unusual. Let's, let's talk about yeah. Ganjiwam, now, because Ganjiwam sure. is what I've heard is a place where people have uh, incredible emotional experiences. Yes, uh, Gunjiwamp, which is in southeastern Connecticut, it's mm. a swamp, but it's mm. preserved, is a good example of what you were talking about before. How did people know? How did people know that these forces That's were right. present? Today, they started realizing that there's something funny going on there when they would take tours of people in mm -hmm. the Gunjiwamp Society. And at the b foot of this one cliff, they came to name the Cliff of Tears. Mm -hmm. People would simply break down hysterically, wow. crying wow. and sobbing. Men would burst into nosebleeds, and a number of women started menstruating spontaneously. Wow. Uh, they took me up there, this, that group, and um, they never even told me which one was the cliff. They were very shrewd about it. They uh -huh. just sort of said, there's some interesting stuff around here. And I followed my instrument up, and running through the face of that cliff is a six-inch band of magnetic ore, uh -huh. which gave the strongest readings I've ever found in a natural setting. And so it was right at that point. And that's th that magnetic strip will trigger some emotions or physiological changes in the body? Apparently it did to a percentage of people, and they were fairly dramatic. And you didn't have anything? Oh. No, I haven't slept out there. Uh, I haven't had the courage <laughs> to try that. And um, I feel there's a lot of other people who are probably more sensitive in that regard. My job is to be the one guy who comes in with instruments and looks objectively at all of this. Well. Thank you for joining us. I mean, my feeling is that there have been people throughout human civilization that have developed their sensitivity and understood from what you're saying the, the true nature of earth energies and have been able to tune their human instrument not only to have spiritual experiences but to have uh, increase in crop pr productivity and to create societies around these special electromagnetic currents in the earth. When you think of it today, the biggest structures that we modern people build are probably hydroelectric dams. Right. And why do we build them? We build them because they're worth the effort, because they produce electricity, which is the lifeblood of an industrial civilization. In this case, we're talking about structures that were built requiring enormous effort that produced fertility, mm -hmm. which is the lifeblood of an agricultural civilization. So looked at that way, they weren't any different than we are. They were just a different set of people working with a different knowledge base and a different set of tools to solve the same problems. Alan, that was a wonderful interview with John Burke. Mm, thank you. What I liked about him is that he's a pretty straight, traditional scientist. He has the instrumentation, and he goes out and measures things that people in the past have felt with their bodies and, and their awareness. Yes, isn't it great that we have those instruments now that we can verify these things and, and prove that people aren't making these things up? 
What I would like is that we start to reconnect with those feelings, those sensitivities, so we can start to feel the earth and the environment more. Yes, most of us are so out of touch because we live in cities, we're surrounded by electromagnetic energies in our homes and cell phones and all sorts of things that we, we really have been dulled down, I think. Right, and we have the human facility. Our brains are probably the best instruments you can have in this universe to be aware of energy. So he is just proving what we've all known and what the ancients actually knew and built these sites around. Yes, the ancients used them for their very survival. And I, we may come to that point ourselves. So I think we need to get back in touch with those energies now. And like he says, we're in this electromagnetic dance all the time. And as we've become more aware, I think we'll be more connected to each other and the universe and whatever's beyond ourselves. Yes, well, I, I believe that uh, these interviewers have presented us with the idea that all things are connected. Well, in your interview that's coming up, we'll have a great example of what is beyond our normal awareness. You want to talk about it? Yes, our next guest will be Nancy Talbot, who is president of BLT Research of Boston. Nancy investigates the effects on crops of a little-known energy or a, a matter that is called plasma. It's a fourth state of matter and it may be a basic element in creation. Nancy measures these energies in crop circles, proving that many of them could not be man-made. So stay tuned as we take you beyond. Nancy, welcome to Hi. the show. Hi. Were you attracted to this research through the same type of experiences that John Burke had with the natural earth energies and phenomena that he observed? Uh, I think John's work is very interesting and is perhaps applicable to certain aspects of the crop circle phenomenon, in particular the geomagnetic aspects, the idea that earth energies may be attracting an atmospheric energy system of some kind uh, to these areas where the crop circles occur. So as we discussed with John, there are certain areas that perhaps uh, crop circles occur in more often because of that geomagnetic energy or the structures underneath the soil. Uh, this last summer, it was very interesting, underneath southern England, of course, you have an aquifer, a chalk aquifer. Yes. And John measured the ground electrical charge in southern England over the summer. And as the aquifer lowers, as the uh, water table lowers, the ground electric charge is increased. And curiously, the number of crop circles increase also as the summer progresses. Furthermore, this electric charge is greatest at the edges of the aquifer. And lo and behold, many of the crop circles occur at the edges of the aquifers. So it's, tan it's tantalizing. It suggests a connection. Well, that's fascinating. And so your research shows that, that perhaps these earth energies attract other energies from uh, the atmosphere in some way that may be responsible for creating these crop circles? Well, uh, William Levengood, the biophysicist in Michigan, uh, demonstrated very clearly that there are changes in the plants and in the soils which are consistent with exposure to a plasma. For those who don't know, could you explain what a plasma is? I'll use John Burke's uh, explanation because it's the simplest one for me. Electrified, these are, it's electrified air molecules. Now, an example of a plasma that you would be familiar with is a lightning strike, a lightning bolt. That's a high energy plasma. A low energy plasma would be uh, your fluorescent lights, for instance. That is, there's, that's a plasma, a low energy plasma. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask if it's related to uh, the northern lights or the aurora borealis. Well, the, the northern lights is another display, but again, a relatively low energy plasma mm -hmm. discharge. Now, Levengood's idea was that perhaps if science has only learned in the last 10, you know, 15 years that these plasmas can penetrate uh, the reflective layers of the ionosphere down to five, six, seven, eight miles, that perhaps they could penetrate all the way down to the Earth's surface. And the mm -hmm. result would be these crop circles. You know, there's enough evidence here to suggest uh, this is a reasonable approach to the phenomenon. And if we now look at the plant work and the soil results, and I show you exactly what's happened to the plants and what's happened to the soils, and how that can be related to this discharge of a plasma. 
uh, it becomes even more reasonable. Whether it's the final reality, you know, I don't know. But the job of science is to uh, get the data and then see where the data leads you. In crop circles, the, the wheat is bent at an angle and uh, often is permanently bent at that angle and stays in that shape. This is, uh, this is rapeseed, canola, a very thick plant. Uh, clearly, this plant would uh, fracture if you tried to bend it. That's what's very interesting about these crop circles that uh, in many cases the crop is very brittle and if, if it were mechanically bent, it would break. It would break and shatter. So you can flatten this stuff until you're blue in the face and you're not going to produce these results. Well, that's important for people to know because I think uh, the general consensus out there has been that these are fake, that they're hoaxes, they're created by people going out with ropes and boards. And well, that's what they've been told, haven't they? They have been told that. This is the first time, the first opportunity, as far as I know, for the public to actually hear some facts. Another thing the American public is unaware of is that crop circles occur here in the States and in Canada and in countries all over the world. That's another reason why it would be difficult to, for the people who claim that they've created the crop circles to have Doug created Doug and Dave them. were very busy. Doug and Dave, two little men uh, who went out after the, uh, the pub drinks closed. at the pub, uh, did not make all the crop circles in the world. Well, if they did, they somehow rather managed to be in five or six countries simultaneously. Well, one of the first findings that Levengood obtained was node elongation. The nodes are knuckle-like protuberances along the stem of the uh, plant. And these are Here uh, samples are, that are taken from crop circles. Yeah, these are. But let me explain this. The, the nodes are the part of the plant that holds the most water. Uh, plasmas automatically, when they spiral, emit microwaves. What do microwaves do? If you have a microwave oven, you know, the microwaves go to the water molecules in whatever it is you're cooking. Well, what we found is in the plants, here we have the most, the majority of the water is at the nodes. And what happens is that that water turns to steam. And as it evaporates, it stretches the tender part of the, the top part of the plant, mm -hmm. the apical node. Now, the, the same thing happens lower down on the stems. But there, because the outer fibers are tough, they're not elastic, they won't stretch. The steam, in order to get out, has to actually blow a hole. Mm -hmm. Here are these holes blown out at the nodes. Again, the steam pressure inside the plant stem is so intense, the steam has to escape. And in the tougher tissue down at the base of the plant, it explodes these holes. And this is mature crop. This was fully mature we, when it occurred. This is the formation itself mm -hmm. at Stanton St. Bernard in England. This is a very uh, elaborate formation, actually. It has uh, a well, number of different circles. When you hear this talk about simple circles yes. are the only ones that are genuine, I beg to differ. Well, in fact, that is the impression that many people have, that uh, the simple circles are maybe caused by a whirlwind or, or some uh, phenomena that would create something uh, not so complex. But these are very elaborate and beautiful formations. Uh, These changes that Levengood has documented now for 12 years uh, absolutely cannot be caused by flattening, mechanical flattening, planks, boards, feet, cement rollers. In addition to this sort of work, which Levengood has repeated, we did, during the years that we were doing this very actively, I think we managed some 250 formations around the world in eight different countries that were sampled in depth. In depth producing consistently these changes. Well, this is the type of work that will prove that this is a real phenomenon. Uh, other people are speculating. You're actually doing the research. Most people are not aware that crop circles occur in all sorts of material. Yes, that's right. I think most people assume that they're all in wheat, but they're not. Oats, barley, rye, all sorts of cereal crops. They also occur in grasses. We have them all the time in grasses. Later on, we're going to talk about one that I saw happen in string beans. Nancy had a very amazing experience that we will go into in depth later. Now, if the science weren't enough to convince me, that really was. <laughs> this is a growth anomaly at the base of the seed head. You see that spiraled Yes, yeah, so the, the stalk is actually bent in a spiral. The, the energy that caused that change had to have occurred when the plants were very young. I now, see. Now, the formation didn't occur until August.
So what are, what's happening here? In other words, there were no flattened plants until August, and yet Levengood is positive that this had to occur, let's say, in late June, at an early That's growth stage. That's very curious, isn't it? Hmm. Now, one of the reason I bring this up is that you, I know you've talked about and have heard about these balls of light. The orbs they're that are seen yes. around mm -hmm. crop circles and videotape. Yes. I have no idea whether this has anything to do with it, but the orbs are photographed and videotaped frequently over fields in which subsequently crop circles are found. So maybe this isn't just a one-stage process. Maybe it's process. a two-stage or more. Yes. That's the question now. Now, uh, among Levengood's other work, uh, one of the things that he has done for years is do germinations. He uh, the lower photograph here are some samples, a sample and a control from a formation in California. Now this happened to be in grasses, no cereal crop at all. And what happened in this case, Levengood had taken some clippings from these plants to do a test he calls the radox test and had put them back in the box, forgotten about them. They sat there for over a week and one day he simply, he opened up the box to see whether it was something he had to do or had already done and found these. Now, no light, no water for eight, nine, ten days, whatever it was. You can see the control is dead. And look at the formation. That's fantastic. Amazing. The control is brown and dried up. The, the one that was in the dark and not watered is Both of them. lush and green and bigger. I mean, obviously, the uh, formation was doing just fine. The controls died under normal circumstances. Most plants will die given no water and no light for seven or eight days. Now, does this relate to what John Burke was saying about uh, perhaps uh, in ancient cultures, the, uh, in the ancient monuments and mounds, the seeds were taken there for the purpose of energizing them? One wonders. One does. One wonders. When we're talking about the same energies. It sounds like we may be, and you know, the question, of course, is did ancient people, were they aware of this? And if they were, how did they become aware? I'm almost as interested in knowing how they found it out as whether or not they did know it. Maybe they weren't as primitive as we think that they Perhaps were. Perhaps they were not. Nancy, I'd like to ask you if uh, Levengood has done any other research related to the crop circles other than with the plants. Oh, uh, yeah, he did look at soils. Uh, a fortuitous event in 1993 uh, at Churhill in England. This is in the Wiltshire mm -hmm. area. Uh, a crop circle had occurred at the very end of the season there. This is late August. It was discovered that was something that looked like a metallic glaze. It was not only covering the plants, it was actually embedded in them. Here so is a photograph show a to show that. how it is embedded in. This is really quite remarkable. There are little round pellets of metal well, that tiny, are embedded tiny, into Tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces literally inside the husks of the wheat seeds. This one is marvelous. It shows a, a bubble. You see, this, this is underneath a scanning electron microscope. And that tiny little, that bubble is a one little piece of this, a one little uh, uh, molecule of, this, of the iron bubbling up because it was hot. If there was that much heat, Nancy, why didn't the crop catch on fire? Because the heat was happening up in the atmosphere is, the, is part of it. The heat was dissipated by the time it actually hit the crop. But also, there is a very thin, waxy covering on the outside of plants. And if the heat is brief enough, the plant can be protected because of that. And this is, these are photographs to show you. We found repeatedly now 75, 80% of the crop circles that we uh, investigate have this melted, this uh, molten iron chunks you know, in the soil, or these tiny little spheres now again, what happens to molten iron when you drop it? How did we make uh, bullets in the Revolutionary War? We heated up lead and we dumped it off of towers. That's what makes it round. That's what makes it round. And we find these little round spheres everywhere inside crop circles. The research is beyond doubt. You've done very careful studies. It's published in scientific journals. Why do people still think that these are made by two little men with boards in the middle of the Mostly night? Mostly it's because that's what they've been told. If they, I think the public, when they're presented with the facts, when they are actually aware of what, what we know, I think at that point the public will ask some very good questions. The public's not stupid. They simply have been treated as if they were stupid by the majority of the media. So if the media is misinforming the public, well, the scientists are being misinformed too. Now, Nancy, uh, I know that you started out as a skeptic in all of this. Not really a skeptic. Uh, 
I was extremely cautious in what I was going to think about. I had a certain uh, emotional response to the designs. So they were very strange, very intriguing. But I've had a demonstration, several actually now, and one very dramatic one last summer, where I saw a formation occur right in front of my face. And when you see it, it's impossible to escape. I, I guarantee you there were no planks and boards. I had been with uh, a young man in Holland who's very unusual and uh, has crop circles happen around him. And every night, he and I had gone out to take photographs in crop circles because you sometimes get very strange uh, photographs in crop circles at night. And he loves to do that. Mm -hmm. And this particular night, he wanted to go back out again. And I was just, I was irritated. And I said to him, you know, that I was sick and tired of the phenomenon. Why couldn't it be uh, more explicit, easier to study? Why was it so hard to study? And the hell with it. I was going upstairs and going to bed. Well, I got into my nightgown. I was sitting in the bed reading for a while. And I started to hear uh, the cattle in the barn right down the road begin to bellow. Now, I know from talking to thousands, well, hundreds, if not thousands by now, of farmers and field, you know, ranch hands and people, that when crop circles occur, frequently you have this animal disturbance. I stayed in the bed and I kept reading. The cattle became quiet. A little bit, five, ten minutes elapsed, and then they started again. And this time they were really bellowing. It was very loud. Well, the next thing that happened was this tube of light, a uh, column, a column or a tube, being perfectly even all the way down. Like came, a shaft coming down? Came screaming down from above. I have never seen anything. I hope I never see anything again with quite that much energy. I don't know how to explain the force with which that thing came down. But here was this tube of brilliant light, and it lasted for a few seconds, and then it disappeared. There was no sound. There was no smell. You know, nothing. It was like it didn't happen. And I was, I was kind of just startled. And then, boom, another one, almost in exactly the same location as the first. And again, the outside lit up. The inside lit up. There was this incredible force. And then it went out. And before I could get out of bed, a third one came down. And it was such force that you tend to go like this. I mean, it was very bright. I wasn't sure, quite sure just how close it was. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure it wasn't going to get me. But anyhow, I'm yelling for Robert by this time. And he is halfway up the stairs because he's seen it. He's yelling for me. And we went immediately to the fence. And I think I had a flashlight and I shined it over. And there in the closest growing crop to my bed and in full view from the bed, I might add, was this brand new crop circle. So this was a demonstration to you of everything that you had studied uh, a pretty clear occurring one. right in front of you. Yeah. And on demand. And no planks or boards. And I think this is probably the best evidence we have on this planet of something that does exist beyond ourselves. I think it may be. And it intrigues me. It's going to keep me staying tuned, as they say. Thank you, Patricia. Very nice. Very well done. What Thank was, you, Alan. Yeah, what was very exciting is that Nancy presented the information in a rational, logical fashion that convinced me that crop circles are indeed not hoaxes, not pranks, but real phenomena that has an unknown mystery. Well, some of the crop circles are hoaxes, uh, and that's fairly easy to prove. But what Nancy's talking about are actual changes in the plants themselves, in the soil, and these are things that can't be created by hoaxers. And what many people feel, from what I've heard, is that there's an energy quality. Once you stand in these circles, you can feel it. Well, you have, so what have you felt? Yes, I'm, I have done a lot of crop circle research. I've uh, been one of those people that runs around to the crop circles in England, and I've recently seen one in the United States. And uh, I do have a, a feeling of, uh, the energy when I walk into those, I can feel it very strongly. Well, it's sort of like John Burke was saying, these ancient peoples could feel energy, so I think people now are rediscovering their sensitivity to all sorts of phenomena. Yes, well, some of us are more sensitive than others, but I think in general, people are reconnecting with the source, with their own bodies even, and, and becoming again sensitive to these energies. So what do you think the crop circles are really there to tell us? 
I think they're there to connect us back into our rightful place in the universe. Mm. For me, they seem like a language. When I look at them, there's information that comes to me that I'm, I'm not conscious of, but I am uh, somehow changed or transformed by. Well, I think that's part of how they connect us back into this mm. uh, place that we have fallen from or lost. They are communicating with us. Mm. So we'll be investigating more of this type of phenomena and new research in this area and other areas. So stay tuned as we take you beyond. I'm Alan Steinfeld. I'm Dr. Patricia Hill. And you have just gone beyond. <laughs>